Well, let's go to the news and see how many yards O.J. Simpson has gained running for his rent-a-car. Ah. <laughs> uh, President Ford is, uh, I'm happy to report, as if you didn't know, is in good health now, and he's uh, back at his office with a full schedule. And the other day, in honor of the nation, he went down and placed a wreath on the tomb of the unknown economic policy. <laughs> That's what the president did. He, it wasn't a particular funny thing he did, but he hasn't got the greatest sense of humor. You know who's in the nation's capital right now? Egyptian President Sadat. And um, our president is very generous. He, uh, he agreed to help President Sadat by giving him $1 billion in economic aid. And when Mayor Beam of New York heard that... <laughs> He, he put on a burnous and ran into the Oval Office yelling, Alms for Allah! Alms for Allah! <laughs> New York. <laughs> Apparently, to get the billion dollars, Egyptian Premier Sadat is pretty clever. He convinced President Ford that the pyramids would look much better with aluminum siding. <laughs> Actually, I'll tell you, the reason Sadat is really here, he wants to be introduced in the audience on the Howard Cosell show. <laughs> now, here's something that is rather serious, and you will probably giggle at it, but, uh... Well, let's hope so. <laughs> what? Let's hope so. No, 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 because it is a rather serious note, uh, on the health scene. Uh, Los Angeles is, is suffering from an infant infestation... <laughs> ...of fruit flies. Fruit flies have invaded Los Angeles. Now, that's a, it's a Mediterranean fruit fly, and it, it poses terrible problems. Uh, not only that, but Police Chief Davis resigned when he heard that. <laughs> oh, the lady over here says, oh, I get that one. <laughs> this is not an IQ test. These are... <laughs> We don't have much time for you to sit and dope these jokes out. Uh, but Governor Brown said that California was prepared for the invasion of fruit flies. He has ordered up the National Guard station at Farmer's Market <laughs> with anti-ballistic melons. <laughs> you know, there could be violence. I went by a sporting goods shop today and saw an avocado buying a handgun. <laughs> That's, uh, avocados have the right to bear arms. <laughs> now, what? You see, here's the problem with the fruit flies, if you don't know what the problem is. No, this could be very serious because it could wipe out. Well, wait a second. I'm, try I'm trying to do our little bit for our state here. These fruit flies are dangerous and they want to get rid of them. And, uh, but the regular insecticides do not work. So, here is their plan. What they're going to try to do is to get the fruit flies, the female fruit flies, to mate with sterile fruit flies. And in that way, they will have no offspring. Now you ask, I can imagine, how do they get... <laughs> how do they get those female fruit flies to mate with those sterile fruit flies? Well, the sterile fruit flies tell them that they'll respect them in the morning. <laughs> Okay. Uh, well, let's go to the television season and see what... Another television show got the axe. This has not been the most uh, skyrocketing season for television. A show called Beacon Hill was dropped by uh, CBS. Now, that is a show, if you have not seen it. It's the story of the Boston rich and, and their servants. And that was canceled. Now, what happened? It happened without warning. It seems that Mr. Lassiter was in bed with the upstairs maid. <laughs> Mrs. Lassiter was down in bed with the downstairs butler. And while they were doing it to each other, the network did it to them. <laughs> I, think, I think the servants in the family heard about the cancellation first because the family uh, members asked a butler when dinner would be ready and the butler said, as soon as you can get your tail over to McDonald's. <laughs> so, I think they knew it in the show. Well, let's see what else happened. Uh, you know whose birthday it is today? I'll bet you don't know. Anybody? Who's? The gentleman right there with the glasses. 
That's true. It is our producer, Freddy Cord, of his birthday today. Happy birthday, Freddy. Happy birthday. And I thought it was clever of you to put Janet in the audience to yell that out. <laughs> don't, don't miss a trick, do you? No. Could you uh, tell him about the cake that the staff gave him? <laughs> No, I, uh, let me, what? It's the only cake with an X rating I have seen. Uh, that cake is going to be rated. It's, uh, it was a... Cake. What? Deep cake. Deep uh -huh. cake. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. Uh, <laughs> along with Fred's birthday, there's somebody, there's another birthday. Was, uh, the Statue of Liberty is 89 years old today. Uh, and in New York, they held a, um, they held a, a big uh, celebration for the Statue of Liberty on the 89th birthday. And instead of a bonfire in order to conserve, you know, energy, they didn't use candles at all. What they did, they just burned up 89 Big Mac bonds. <laughs> That's what they did. I think it was your birthday hurt the rhythm here. <laughs> Here's an interesting item. This is the, the year of the, uh, of the women, right? Women's organizations are uh, trying to get things going. The Girl Scouts finally have agreed to accept Boy Scouts into their organization. That's absolutely true. Yes. What? They voted it down. All right. They voted that down. That's the latest report. <laughs> We like to bring you the late breaking news here on the show. And even though I had a joke about it, the joke has been voted by a vote of our audience. The joke has been voted down. What but let's say if they accept yeah, it. Yeah, that's it. If they change their mind, what? What? If they change their mind and accept them. Well, it's too late now. <laughs> Try it. What? You try it. Well, boys, an interesting experiment. Boys and girls together, you know, I can see a little girl scout running into her camp leader and said, he broke my cookies. <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, that could happen. That's true, because they sell those cookies <laughs> all year, year round. And out on the trail together to build a fire, they could rub, rub Murray and Shirley together. <laughs> anyway, you were probably right. They didn't let them in. <laughs> Tonight, we have on the show, Mr. Robert Blake is with us tonight. Very funny comedian, Kelly Monteith is here. We have a columnist by the name of Tom Braden, who has written a fascinating book called Eight is Enough. I think you will enjoy it very much. A gentleman I have not met that you probably do not know. His name is Albert Weber, and he has a very unusual occupation, and we thought you might like to hear about it tonight. We won't even tell you what it is. And do we have something else? Well, that's it. What? Old Webb, a visitor. Oh, do we have a visitor? A dear, sweet, old visitor. Oh, this will be a nice night for her, so we'll be with you. Doc, one of our favorite people is back with us tonight. Like many of these senior citizens, she's going back to college to prove that age is no barrier to learning. And it's never too late to grow and improve your mind. Would you welcome, please, dear, sweet, lovable, old, and Blappy. Trying to help you up the steps. Stagehand tried to get me just as I really? came out. Trying to help. Awful people. You're looking so good. Oh, it's great, great to see you. It's a great feeling to be alive. Yes. I wish I had that feeling. <laughs> it's good uh, to see you again, too, Aunt Thank Bobby. you, bless you. How have you been? Fit as a fiddle and ready for love. <laughs> 
I can't wait for someone to bust my strings. <laughs> Aunt Lammy, I understand that you went back to college. Oh, yes. I wanted to improve my mind. It's too late for my body. No. But the mind, you no, can no, always no. improve. There's nothing wrong with your body. It's easy for you to say you're not in it. <laughs> you ought to see it from in here. <laughs> A mess. <laughs> Many women today are studying to be doctors and are lawyers. Are they? Yes. Oh. Do you have any specific goal in mind? Yes, living until graduation. That's my goal. <laughs> So you eventually want to get a sheepskin. Why not? It's better than the skin I've got. <laughs> Wrinkles. College is a wonderful thing. It's a great feeling to walk down the street and hear, see people point and say, there goes a Ph.D. A Ph.D., a doctor of philosophy. No, a preparation H, dame. <laughs> it's me going. Aunt Blimey, yes. it's interesting that you decided to go back to college and continue your education. Well, it's not only interesting, it's necessary to this sketch. If we don't set that up, we got nothing. I was always a good student. You oh, know yes? that? Yes. I, in high school, I completed a course in history in just two weeks. Two weeks? How did you do that? That's all the history there was when I was in high school. <laughs> two weeks. Two weeks. Yes. That was a long time ago, you see. Yes. And, Flabby, just what are you majoring in? Minors. <laughs> I matriculate every chance I get. <laughs> what are the uh, subjects you are taking? Chemistry. Uh, chemistry? Why chemistry? Well, I want to find out the formula that'll prevent leg cramps in the back seat of a car. <laughs> the government hasn't done enough on that. I see. They haven't done enough for this sketch either. What? <laughs> but they should work on that. <laughs> Somebody should work on something so we can get rolling here. <laughs> What other subjects are you studying? Archaeology. Oh, you search for relics of bygone civilizations and cultures. So far, have you uncovered any ancient skeletons? Only my first three husbands. I didn't know you were married three times. Well, I'm old-fashioned, you oh? see. I don't put out without a license. <laughs> you gotta, gotta have the paper for a group. <laughs> And, Flappy, archaeology requires a, a, a massive amount of research. Don't say massive to an old person. Those are words we don't like. I find biology to be an interesting subject. You find biology... Do you mind if I sit down? No. You find... I want to rest during this. You find biology interesting? I find it more than interesting. I learned some things about monkeys that are well worth trying. Oh? Did you know... Did you know that monkey glands can improve your sex life? Is that a fact? Yes, that's why they won't give them up without a fight. <laughs> Hoop, you never heard such hoopering and hollering. Hoopering. 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 You must do a lot of studying. How are you doing? Not bad. I just passed six subjects and three kidney stones. <laughs> And Blabby, has college changed much since you first went there? What? Has college changed much since you first went there? I can hear you. Oh, okay. Yes, when I first went to college, the big fed on campus. You guess what it was? I think I know. What? The goldfish? Was... Ah, you knew! <laughs> swallowing goldfish. That's right, yeah. Yes, that was big. But students today are more serious-minded than that. They don't go around swallowing strange things like goldfish. Oh, I don't know. The other day, Earl Butts made a speech on campus. And if you can swallow that, you can swallow anything. And Blabby, when you first went to college, were you a Phi Beta Kappa? No, I always took precautions. <laughs> what do you, um... What do you like best about campus life these days? What? What do you like best about campus life these days? The co-ed restrooms. Co-ed restrooms? Well, when everybody's wearing jeans, who knows the difference? Many students... If they ain't there, don't wait. I thought there might be a lot. No, I didn't want to jump the lamp. You didn't know. You didn't. I didn't jump it. You'll know when to jump. <laughs> When students go to college and become involved in protest groups, they succumb to a... a don't, don't say succumb to an old person. I'm glad you brought that up, Lard Lips. You know, we senior citizens had a protest rally just the other day. What was the purpose of your demonstration? To legalize prunes on campus. If they catch you with more than one ounce of prunes, you'd better get F. Lee Bailey. What did jump the... Jump quick. <laughs> what did the senior citizens do? Now you jump. <laughs> what did the senior citizens do? We formed a circle around the faculty building. 
Did you lock arms? We didn't have to. Our arms were already locked. You know how that is. You've been stiff in a few joints yourself, oh. haven't you? Yeah. Did you get that for me? Okay, now we're back on rhythm. <laughs> you said you surrounded the faculty building? You're alert. That's what I said. What yes. else did you do to protest? Well, after an hour of shouting prune power, we all leaned over and soaked our dentures in the giant fountain. <laughs> we called it a gum in. <laughs> then they called out the National Guard. They showed up and hosed us down with Haley's M.O. <laughs> and gladly in, uh, in view of today's economy, how can you afford the high tuition? What do you mean? Well, you have no visible means of support. I've got these support hose on. If my garter ever snaps, my neck is going to do a swan dive into my shoes. I could get on a Howard Cosell show with that. Uh, they had that dumb whale on Saturday. I guess, uh, I guess you'll be... Put looking... a dumb whale on a show. I guess... Say it's live. Who cares? I guess you'll be looking forward to midterm recess. When does your first term expire? Don't say expire to an old lady. Aunt Blabby, is it true there's... Lots of drugs on campus? That's wrong. The strongest thing I ever saw the students using was an O. Henry candy bar. You ever have one of those? No. Awfully tough to keep lit. <laughs> Man, I speak out like Betty Ford, you see. I'm liberal. Are you involved in all of these social activities on campus? I was asked to be a cheerleader once. Because you look good in a sweater? No, because I can do a lot of things with a baton they've never heard of. <laughs> I wonder, Aunt Blabby, if you could demonstrate one of your school cheers. I don't see why not. I'm covered by the auto club. Here's a cheer. It was made up just for me. Give me, give me J, give me an R, give me an X, give me P, give me G, give me a zoo, give me a Q. <laughs> give me a P. Wait a minute. Give you a J, an R, an X, a P, you... a zoo, a Z, a Q, and a B? You, you got it, you got it. <laughs> oh, what is that? That doesn't spell anything. Nothing. It's an eye test at my doctor's, dummy. <laughs> be late for the panty raid. Wait a minute, you're going to a panty raid? Yes, and I hope it's mine. <laughs> oh. After we pause for this brief intermission, we'll be right back. <laughs> We're back. All right, tonight we have... Happy birthday to you, Fred. Happy birthday, Fred. Our Freddie's birthday tonight, we have uh, Robert Blake, <laughs> Kelly Monteith, Tom Braden, and Albert. Albert Weber, you're going to meet right now. Uh, you know, we try to bring you things in good taste occasionally on yes. the show. Tonight, we thought we would bring you something in good smell. Albert Weber works for the Food and Drug Administration in Brooklyn. His official title is Chemist, Analytical Organoleptic Specialist, Seafood. Hmm. Now, this, what is true. This, is, this is not a put on or anything like that. Well, his job is to smell fish for the government and say whether it's fit to eat or not. This is not a joke. It's not an actor. This is a gentleman who has this job. We thought it would be fascinating. Hmm. Would you welcome Mr. Al Albert Weber? How are you, Mr. Weber? We're feeling fine. Yeah, usually when I would introduce somebody like that, I'm sure the audience would think we're, we're going to come out with a professional actor and make believe it's not a... But this is a real job you have, isn't it? It's a real job. Did I pronounce that right? The, That's uh, right. The analytical organoleptic... That's right. ...specialist seafood. That's right. All it means is using your senses to do your analytical work. <laughs> yeah. How does, why does the government need somebody to, uh, to smell fish? Well, it's the easiest and quickest way to determine if any seafood, or any food for most cases, is uh, decomposed or if it's not. Oh, I uh, see. Chemical means uh, where you do have them are slow and cumbersome and takes time. So the human... Nose beats them all. Yeah. How did you get into this job? Well, I was working for the food and drugs and chemists, and part of the work was to... Sometimes you was called upon to smell the fish... And one day when I was there in just a short time, the regular fish smellers were out, and I was pressed into service. The head smeller got, uh, was out of business. Well, he was out of town. I was out of town. So oh. I was pressed into it, and, and I'll never forget it because it was a real stinking sample. 
Nobody, when I got onto public transportation, nobody would sit next to me. They'd sit down and get up, get home, walk in the house. My wife says, my God, what were you doing? You stink. Take off your clothes and take a shower. That was my first experience smelling. I never thought about that. would be a hazard, wouldn't it, if you've been, if you've been around uh, uh, fish uh, all day? What do you do? Do you Especially change? Do you change now before you go home? I mean, well, I either change or I generally get home now before my wife so I can get the stink clothes off. Yeah. <laughs> Does this require a certain a trained nose? I mean, can anybody learn to do this, or mm-hmm. is and, anybody wanted to learn to do this? Any, anybody with a good sense of smell can do the work, and all they have to do is to be trained to interpret what they smell, mm-hmm. because not all stink odors are decomposition, <laughs> because there's plenty of stinks, but it has nothing to do with decomposition. <laughs> You have a very uh, involved technical vocabulary. In this. <laughs> that's still the best word. To say something is odiferous kind of is, is ridiculous, isn't it? If something stinks, it stinks. Well, that's what I say. Yeah. Uh, I say I smell, but the fish stinks. That's right. People smell, but I guess people could stink, but not as much as a... Uh... Well, I do stink when I get yeah. through some days. All right. We have to take a short break, but we're going to come back and, and follow up how you do this. And uh, somebody says they've arranged a, a little demonstration of, uh, of something. I don't think it's around here yet, is it? (laughs) Unless the cake is going bad. (laughs) So we'll take a short break, and we'll be right back with Mr. Webb. Robert Blake will join us shortly, and we have Tom Braden and Kelly Monteith. Right now we're talking with Albert Weber, who is, uh, I guess, fish smeller, to, to make a short title for the city of Brooklyn, right? That's good. Now, let, let, let me ask you this. Are there any side effects to this job? I mean, does it dull your oh, senses after a while? Oh, well, sure, you can't be smelling all day without, uh, as I call, a nose break. And, uh, <laughs> without a nose break? Yes, uh, you, just, you just stop uh, smelling whatever you're smelling and get out of the room and either do something else or just go out and get some fresh air. Yeah. Because Are there uh, certain foods that you can't eat that would interfere with... Well, the foods, uh, no, not eating foods, but uh, if someone's working with you, you've got to be careful what you uh, have on your line, the cosmetics. You can't use aftershave lotion because it won't bother you, but it'll bother the person next to you. Uh, I don't like anybody to come in smoking in the room I'm working because that just makes the job that much harder. Right. And anyway, smoke annoys me. Yeah. Oh, okay, well, I've got my... <laughs> I've got, I've got mine out over here. You've got a uh, point there. But I'm not working. Yeah. Now, what are you doing uh, out here in Los Angeles? Is this a vacation or is this official? Or no. did you come out here to smell our we, city? We, or? We, uh, no. no, we came out here to uh, ma- uh, make some authentic packs. And uh, at the kindness of the Fish King processors, mm-hmm. they gave us facilities and supplying us with good fresh shrimp, which we are... I say we because here in the audience who uh, are my co-workers, we have Dick Strong from Seattle, who's uh, the West Coast expert. And we have Frank Allhands from Washington, yeah. uh, who's also an expert, and then a lot with uh, Ed Losowitz. Yeah. And uh, we're making these uh, authentic packs to late next right. month to conduct uh, international fish mo- No, we take the fresh shrimp, and that's classified as class one. And by definition, it's a good commercial quality. And then as it starts to decompose, we call it class two. What do you do with that bad stuff? Well, with the bad stuff, if it's uh, within the tolerances, we pass it. If it's outside the tolerances, if it's an import, it's detained, and the importer has can destroy it or ship it back to the country or bring it within the... Uh, that must be wonderful when it gets back to the country if it's already... <laughs> well, it comes in frozen. Oh, I see. You see, most of this decomposition takes place between the time catching and freezing. If they mishandle it, don't keep enough ice or refrigeration... That's when fish it generally goes bad, huh? Yes. So takes, uh, you can keep a fish just slightly iced for two weeks before it starts to uh, decompose, but then it goes very fast. Now, we have a couple of samples here, and I don't exactly know what they are. Well, um, can you tell us? Uh, of course, our television audience won't, uh, at home won't be able to appreciate this because uh, we Do don't you have... folks like uh, wine with your dinner? <laughs> <laughs> no. No, we have, we have two samples of shrimp here. Uh, here, this, this... Don't have to worry about this one. Oh. This is good, fresh... Shrimp. I would have guessed. It's class one. I would have guessed that this was 
Good well, or bad? N- not necess- no, not necessarily. Because it's a different color. You, you, can't, you, can't go, you can't go by color. You have to go by odor. And all you have to do to see if it's good or bad, just break, break it, it to the flesh, give it a little short sniff. Right. And, and that's, that's, a, that's a good shrimp. And that's a good odor. If I eat shrimp, if I eat shrimp, I would eat those. Uh-huh. Now, this is class three. Class three. You see, you see the change in the color. These... these, <laughs> these to come out from Brooklyn to sail that was... <laughs> you could smell that in Brooklyn. <laughs> Woo! Wow! Surprising. We oh, get, boy. Su- surprisingly, we get samples of shrimp that smells ja- that bad and worse. Really? You yes. don't have to break one of those, though, to know. No, but that, those you don't have to break. Now, that's what do you call a class three. That's a class three. What, what do you do with those? You get the sample, get they, rid of they, them? They go down the sewer. Whew. Oh, boy. There's no way to use those. You, does your nose get used to smelling something that foul? That, that is that's not a, a, That's that the is... kind that makes you sick. And there's, uh... <laughs> just by smelling at times. I, you could smell it. Did, did, you, did you ever get ill on the job? I mean... Uh, uh, I get... I have some allergies from decomposed uh, products, particularly frog's legs. I also have to take some antihistamines before I smell them. These I can't smell too long before I get headaches. No, I can back and, <laughs> Although I think sm- that could be We similar. also examine uh, decomposed tuna, and in that case, if you have some real bad stuff, my hands break all and rash it, and I get terrific headaches. <laughs> well, that's a tough job, but it's an important job, and one that has to be done, it's right? It's a job that has to be done. It's a job I don't like to do, but uh, how can you if you smell that stink all day? That's right. <laughs> Somebody's got to smell those things. And uh, Albert, I thank you for being here. You're a nice gentleman, and I wish you well. And how many more years are you going to do this? Well, I'm retired, but they rehired me for one year extension. Don't they let him give you, you a golden help. carp at the end of it. <laughs> Albert, thanks for being here. Mm. Oh, boy. What won't you be ordering as an appetizer tonight? <laughs> You know, you, you can have a can of right guard here, and a little white flag would come out <laughs> if you press the button. Oh. Oh. Pungent is the word. Oh. No, that's not... That's no, pun, that's pungent. not pungent. That's, that's uh, whew, You wouldn't have to be... I mean, uh, the man's an expert, but, I mean, you could, uh, you could bring a, a, a gorilla in, <laughs> and he, yeah, would know, he would know that that ain't a good fish. <laughs> whew, is that... Huh, oh, set you yes. free in the mm-hmm. nostrils? Uh, you folks couldn't smell it out there, could you? You're very lucky. Just as well. All right, we'll be right back after this brief commercial break. Okay, we are back, and... A good friend of mine, I admire him tremendously. He's a, he's a super actor, won an Emmy this year. He's the star of his own show, Beretta. Would you welcome Robert Blake. <laughs> You dyed your T-shirt, huh? Yeah. Now they dressed me all up there, right? That's all you got to do is have a little clothes in this world and you're home free. That's it. Studio's checking your wardrobe now. When you make these oh, appearances, yeah. I want you to look yeah. decent. I'm so it. tired, man. My brain is a bag of bananas. <laughs> you want to go back and get on that horse and say, hey, Red? No, no, want... no. Oh, okay, I want to get that in perspective no. real fast. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> this sounds better already, doesn't it? <laughs> what the hell is the matter around here? <laughs> you got a great spot, huh? Following, oh. following it. <laughs> no, you should have been. No, no, come on, it's gone. You should have been here a moment ago. Oh. I want to tell you. That it stinks re- right now here oh, in this very spot. No, it, it stinks. It's true. And I took a shower and put clean clothes on and everything. Oh, show like business that, you've my had, you've following had. a rotten fish. <laughs> You've had some dumb jobs in your life, right? Yeah. Oh, I've had all kinds of jobs in my life, man. Any kind of job. I've, I've been a gorilla most of my days. <laughs> I, w- I think I could have been a brain surgeon. But I didn't have much education. I, I could have be been... I want to be a doctor, too, one time. Did you really? Yeah, I really did. Wouldn't that be cool just to have somebody come in and just say, I'll save you. It's all right. Don't worry. Whatever's wrong with you, just sit right down there and I'll take care of everything. No, it's just that I like golf. 
You what? I just like golf. That's why I want to be a doctor. <laughs> I don't care anything oh, about golf. that. Oh, golf. Yeah, golf. You know, golf. You, you play golf? I used to. I quit. Yeah. I quit. I don't do that much. What, no. what do you, you work out a lot, I know. You keep in shape. Uh, yeah, that's right. Health foods? That's jailhouse exercises I do. You shoot pool, lift weights, play ping pong, all the stuff they got in the rec room in the joint. <laughs> So you don't go outside much, huh? No, that's... No, I don't. Well, yeah, no, I go outside, but not to do any of them whippy things, no. Did you go through the... Did I you go, go out through, to the dirt. Did you go through the health food stuff? Where yeah. Where got the soybeans and the... I the, eat a lot the, of health food, and I take a lot of vitamins to counteract an incredible amount of garbage that I eat. <laughs> yeah. I load up on chili dogs and yeah. soft drinks and poisons aren't, of various or sundry sorts. Aren't they great, Assaulting though? my body. Aren't yes. they great when you're... <laughs> They're no forward. good for you, so I counteract it by taking all that other stuff, as a result of which I eat all the time. <laughs> How you been? What's new in your life? I see, oh, let's you know, see. I see. Where am I? I never thought I'd see today you'd be doing Hollywood squares. Well, I'll tell you. Because you were kind of anti-establishment and so forth, and all of a sudden I see you up there saying Robert Blake and square number six. My whole life in, uh, in school, I was a dummy. And uh, the first IQ test I had was a 85 and that's, that doesn't mean anything that's, see that's when they give you a banana and a, and a spare tire to play with <laughs> <laughs> and say don't chase the cars that's right <laughs> he's getting out of line hose down his cage cool him out man. So cool. that really doesn't those IQ tests as you know and probably no. do are not reliable it took me 1100 years to learn that because uh, when I was in the army strange thing happened I took a test and they asked me if I wanted to go to OCS. And I said, what's that? Because I didn't know a two from an L, from a nine, from nothing. But they said, well, you passed very high here because it was a different kind of test. It was a test about uh, logic and how you use your mind right. rather than who was the president in 1806 and what did he do on Tuesday because I never learned none of that in school. <laughs> nothing. I didn't I, learn nothing. IQ tests are only valid in a particular area in which people would, would navigate. You They're have outside to of their research the subject entirely before you give them the test right because if somebody has not gone through any kind of scholastic environment you can't give them a test about the declaration of independence right. i don't know what holiday is coming up now i never know what holiday is coming up man the fourth of what and what does it mean and who cares that's you know because i never learned none of that stuff yeah. so anyway i took the o uh, ocs test christmas is on the 25th <laughs> yeah just thought i just yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know that. And then, when I was in therapy, after I've been in therapy for about four years, that's where you go and you talk to somebody and they talk back to you. Uh, I took an IQ test just to find out for myself if I really truly was a dummy, which was a big step because my whole thing in therapy was to keep telling the guy that I'm a fool and I don't know nothing and I'm a dummy. And I ranked up way into one-tenth of one percent of the population and all that kind of jive. What well, you see? See, so you keep changing around. Where were we? How we get to this IQ I test, man? Know. You wanted to be a doctor and play tennis. That's where we started, yeah. I What's new? What's new in my world? Ain't nothing new in my world. I work 89 hours a day, man. And I'm a giant success. <laughs> Has it made you happier? Yeah. No? Well, let's see. Uh, I'm serious. Has it made you relatively happier? Boy, that's a tough question, man. You usually ask funny ones. <laughs> All right, are you funnier <laughs> since you've had all the success? No, no you don't. So I mean, that's tired. a dumb question. I'll tell you, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not particularly happier, uh, but uh, everything, like, see, my family is a lot happier, and that makes me happy. Yeah. You know, because they know that I'm working and everything is cool, and we do a few things like that, like I bought a, 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 a fence to put around my house so nobody could bother me. That's a very big deal to me. A lot of people don't care about a fence, but all of a sudden, I like having a fence. Because uh, 6 o'clock in the morning, some drunk come walking up and say, Hey, you guys rather play in the Brahma, Zama, Zama? And I just don't like that. So I got that. I got a watchdog. He's cool, man. Is he trained? He's nuts. He belongs in the Blake household. That guy's <laughs> bananas. He's Leslie. I got him when he was eight weeks old. What okay. kind? Uh, uh, a Siberian Husky. Oh, on account Siberian of my wife from Husky. Russia. Yeah. He's a great dog. He's about 16 weeks old now. And his whole life since I've known him, and we got to be friends, he eats socks. That's his big bag. He eats socks? He eats socks. He whips around the house finding socks. The guy eats anything. 
He he took a he took a, a, a can, you know, with the food in it. Yeah. And he ripped it open with his mouth to get the <laughs> ripped food. Ripped open up. the can. He's a t yeah. So he eats socks. You sure you don't have a small pony? What I mean, what is? <laughs> no. How big are they? I don't know whether he barfs them up or digests them. I never find him no place. How big is it? Is it a Siberian husky again? Uh, I don't know. You know. They get big. They get like yeah. a, you know, like a big dog. I want them to scare people away so I don't have to shoot them when they come by. <laughs> he ate, uh, he ate Sandra's, um, you know, what's them things that come up here? The stockings? Pantyhose. Right. He ate them. And I caught him. <laughs> was Sandra in them at the time? <laughs> I caught him when there was nothing but the two feet sticking out of his mouth. <laughs> And I grabbed him, and I was starting to pull him out, but he started gagging like he was going to barf or check out or something, so I let him go, and he went, yerp, and disappeared down the street. <laughs> a pair of candy hose? Yeah. He did. You got a wild, you got a strange dog there. That's good, man. Just imagine one of them freak comes around the house. The dog, I, when I, by the time I get to the freak, all it'd be is two feet coming out of the dog's mouth. Right? Well, wouldn't that be great just teach the dog to come out with two feet sticking out? We're going to take a we'll short come break. right back. Certainly we will. When Robert gets himself together. That's right. We're going to have another, another session here on the couch. Oh, Bob, we are back. You were you're dozing off here during the commercial. Yeah. What time do you get up? When, when, when do you go to rehearsal? Uh, what? We don't rehearse. You don't rehearse. Just no, go. No, you folks in the live telly rehearse. We don't what do you mean? We that. show up here. We get up at five bells and oh, report boy. downtown to Fifth and Los Angeles. Man, I was rolling around the other day in so much puke and stuff like, you know, down there, it's a whole other world. Yeah. You forget what some of them folks go through and where they have to go to the john and who's got to work in it and all like that. <laughs> anyway, that goes on until about 7 or 8 o'clock at night and then you go home and uh, that's success, folks. That's the big <laughs> leagues. <laughs> You had a birthday, didn't you, a week or so ago? Yes. Oh, I had a wondrous birthday. I hate birthdays, man. I don't <laughs> like birthdays. Did you um, have, didn't you have a cake and all that? No. No, I refuse to go through any of that stuff. It makes <laughs> panics me out. Why? Well, because I never got anything that I wanted for my birthday. Christmas, stuff like that comes along and... Oh, a robe. Oh, gee, that's wonderful. <laughs> gee, I really always wanted a robe. Oh, my goodness, some new pants that I could wear to school. Isn't that terrific? You know... <laughs> They use an excuse to buy you stuff that they're going to have to buy you anyway to keep you <laughs> going around. Like a pair of clothes. socks. Yeah, right. Oh, socks. that's wonderful. Eight new socks for my birthday. <laughs> it could be worse. It could be seven. And then, you see, what you have to do is you got to act like you love it. Right. Ah, oh, gee whiz, Ma, you really came through this time. That's terrific. Does anybody ever get anything they want for their birthday? I don't think so, man. Oh. Why? What did you want? Supposed I wanted a new train, man. I want something cool. I want a pack <laughs> something like <laughs> something like to be somebody. Something that with. keeps on giving. Yeah. <laughs> you see some kid down the street that got a new Boy Scout knife. Yeah. Did you ever hey, get a you Boy know Scout that's knife? fascinating. I have a collection of knives, and I never realized why. Uh, but it's because when I was a kid, I always wanted to get a pocket knife. With what? all those things on it? Yeah, with the all damn them things never worked. Things. I got one. You're lucky oh, you never I'd got one. I just opened it up and put it next to my head when I went to sleep and looked at it. It would have been cool to have one. It yeah, they had a, a screwdriver, they had a can opener, they had a yeah, compass. They all had those a... things. All those things that the white kids had, man. Just <laughs> wonderful toys and gadgets you could play with. And I'm sitting there with something that I had. A... So anyway, I don't like birthdays. <laughs> what I'm going to do someday is I'm going to give myself a birthday. And I'm going to get drunk and have a cake. And I'm going to buy everything that I ever wanted to have when I was a kid. One for each year of my life. I'm going to get a bicycle. I never had a bicycle either. I sound like I'm a little juice, but I ain't had nothing to drink. I'm just tired. <laughs> Once I found a bicycle. Found a bicycle? <laughs> Where did you find this bicycle? <laughs> <laughs> and the chain, I suppose, that went with it, huh? <laughs> I can see you find it. What do you mean you found the bicycle? It was a girl's bicycle. Oh. And uh, I took that bicycle, and I rode it, and I rode it, and I rode it. But I always kept riding it fast, man, because I was afraid if I slowed down, somebody would get a look at it. <laughs> uh 
hot bicycle. I kept it in a vacant lot down at the corner in the grass. And in the wintertime, you know, the grass grows tall in the vacant lots. You could hide anything in it. I always had fantasies about having a girl and taking her out to a vacant lot where there was grass. And just hide her for the winter, you mean? No, I'd be there with her. Oh, I see. We'd be laying down in the grass and nobody could see us in the whole world just laying in the grass. Didn't you ever do that? No, I didn't do that. I had that bike in the grass. <laughs> It's not the same. Did you do that? Not, not the same. That's how I had a girl in Nebraska, a 10 speed girl. <laughs> Used to go out in the cornfields, you see, in the oh, cornfields in the, on the fall. That's how it's come you've got the courage to sit here every night. You know who you are on account of you had a girl out in the green grass in the wintertime. That would be ace. That was terrific. I used to go out and lay in that grass and roll around, and there was rotten beer cans that would tear at you and all and no stuff girl? like that. No, oh, well, never stop. had no girl. There was Nancy down the block, but uh -huh. she could run faster than I could. Oh. We would we'd play hide-and-go-seek. Well, and no. I just, one thing in my that life. normal. If Nancy would have only tripped, <laughs> I would have been all up over her, quick like a flash. <laughs> well, that, that's not the way you play hide-and-seek, no. you know. I didn't know. I didn't know. Nobody <laughs> explained the rules. No, I never went to public school. I didn't know what the hell they were doing, man. I'm going to throw your birthday party your next birthday. No, don't do it, John. Oh, really? Wipe me right out. Oh, what the we ground do? floor up. Yeah, they was going to throw me a party on the set, you know, where I do uh, <laughs> Petrocelli. Said... Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I, said, I said, no, I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't go for it. Just pass on it. Really? Be cool. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't do it. A lot I... of things, it takes a long time to get past. I don't ever admit that I'm healthy, you see. I just go along with what I'm doing. Like... The other day, I told a very good friend of mine, I said, don't kiss my wife. I don't like nobody oh, don't to kiss mean? my wife. Oh, you mean at parties and stuff? Any me... place. Any <laughs> place. I don't care. I wasn't, I just brought it up. I wasn't going to do it. I... I don't care if it's her brother come in from Guatemala after 20 years. I don't want nobody putting their hands on my wife. Well, no, you don't and own I her, you know. And I know it's sick. You don't I know, own her. I know that. I'm probably one of the great women's libbers of all time. I want them to take over, man. We made such a mess. I don't want them to have equal. I want them to do it. And we'll lay back and see how they do. See how it goes. Right. But when it comes to anybody... No kissing. It just panics me right out, man. Now, I, I, it's wrong, and ain't nothing I can do about it. But if my best friend said, Oh, Sandra, it's so nice to see you. Let me just give you a little here. I twitch, man. I want, I'm going to break some part of his body. That's the part of your choice, huh? That's you know. right. I'm just, I know what you mean. I hate that at parties I'm where everybody well. is. I don't like nobody to kiss me. You're you know, safe. You know, you go You're to a safe, party huh? and shake hands. Oh, Robert, so nice to and see they, you. And they kiss you. What do you do? So, well, what I want to do is just grab them and just stick my tongue down their mouth. See? <laughs> <laughs> then they won't do it no more. Yeah. Especially if it's... That, that would teach me a lesson, yeah. <laughs> we'll take a beer for us. We'll be right back. <laughs> Eat me to the punchline. Keith is with us tonight. He is, uh... Thank you, Doc. Kelly's a very amusing young gentleman. He grew up in St. Louis. He made his first appearance with us, I think, about two years on the show, and it's, it's fun to watch his continued growth. Uh, he'll be opening tomorrow night at the Sands Hotel in Las Vegas with Bobby Gentry on the 13th of November up at Harrah's and Arena with Connie Stevens. Would you welcome Kelly Monteith. Kelly! <laughs> Thank you for that, uh, that nice welcome. How are you all? My name is Kelly Monteith. I, uh, I usually repeat my name when I come on stage. To, uh, actually, the main reason I do that is just to kind of assert my identity a little bit. Because that's the one drawback I find to traveling, is it, it tends to lose your identity on the road, you know. Because I'm never in one place for a length of time, and most of the people I run into, they really don't know me as an individual. They just identify me with their work. Like I stay in hotels, and a maid will see me in a hall. And to a hotel maid, I'm not Kelly Monteith. I'm a room number. That's how she'll identify me. Aren't you 1214? What? You're 1214, aren't you? Oh, yeah. That's me, 1214. That's why I have this terrible fear now of dying in a hotel and being buried as a room number. <laughs> See it on my tombstone someplace. Here lies 1214. Sanitize for your protection. <laughs> It's the same in restaurants, because I eat out all the time. You know, and waitresses, they don't know me as Kelly Monte. To a waitress, I'm a food order. Because that's how waitresses identify people. We probably had him do that, too. You'd be in a coffee shop or something. They come up to the table. Feel Parmesan? Liver and onions? 
And people at the table do the same thing. They go, no, I'm liver and onions. This is veal parmesan. <laughs> and this is chopstick, and that's tomato surprise. <laughs> Every time I do TV, I know there's some waitress in Alabama watching me going, oh, I know him. That's scrambled eggs, bacon, and no grits. <laughs> So I guess we are what we eat in that sense. Actually, I think uh, most of what I am really stems back to my childhood. Because, you know, I've traced so many of my little idiosyncrasies back then. I have a tendency to be a, a germ freak. Now, I'm not obsessed about germs. I don't boil things before I use them. But I'm always concerned about them. You know, I never could figure out why. And then I realized, I remember when I was a kid, adults and parents and teachers were always coming down on me about germs. Come in from outside. Okay, run in, wash your hands. Why? Well, you've touched things. There's germs on your fingers. You've touched things. You don't know where they've been. Well, I was on the jungle gym. I hasn't left the playground in 14 years. Well, other people touch it. You don't know where they've been. Now, run, wash your hands. Did you go to the bathroom? Yes. Did you wash your hands? No. Why not? I know where it's been. <laughs> that never worked. Get back in there and wash your hands. There's germs on your fingers. Germs, this constant emphasis on germs. Now, being a, a germ freak as an adult, that's kind of difficult to handle, you know. Because I'll, I'll be at a party or something talking to somebody. And all of a sudden, during the course of their conversation, I'll feel this drop of saliva land on my cheek. <laughs> now, you know, from all that early training about germs, my first impulse is to go, ah! <laughs> But I can't do something like that in a social situation, you know. So I got to stand there and just grit my teeth and let it evaporate. Oh, I could brush it off real cool, but I'd give it away because I'd want to look at it, you see. Because <laughs> we always look at what we get off our bodies, but we're always so curious as to what is there, we've got to check everything out and examine it and study it. <laughs> what the hell are we looking for, anyway? Well, maybe I'll know it when I see it, you know. Maybe someday I'll go, what in God? Well, for crying out loud. I haven't seen that since the fifth grade. <laughs> Just little habits that we all have. Man, so much of my day-to-day -day existence is consumed by habits. Things that I do, things I say. Greeting people, that's habitual. Hi, how are you? That usually gets the same answer. Fine, how are you? Fine, thank you. Now, you know something? That exchange has said so much that people don't even hear what you say. You can say anything to them. Hi, how are you? Up your nose. Fine, thank you. <laughs> Because they're not listening. We respond automatically. Thank you. That's a perfect example. <laughs> How many times a day do you hear those two words? Thank you. How many times a day do you say them? Thank you. You can't thank somebody without being thanked back. Thank you. Thank you, too. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you much. Thank you very much. Thank you now. Never could understand that one, as opposed, I guess, to thank you later. <laughs> Gets ridiculous. I found myself thanking people for thanking me. Hey, got your thank you note. Thank you. <laughs> And they'll throw it back at me. Oh, don't thank me. Thank you. <laughs> I hate to pay a check at a restaurant anymore. I go through an orgy of thank yous with a cashier. Enjoy your meal, sir. Oh, yes, thank you. It's very good. Well, thank you. Here's your change now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Have a nice day. Well, thanks. You too. Well, thank you. <laughs> And then I'll walk out a door, and it says, thank you. <laughs> you see, it's automatic. People say without even thinking, you're fired. Thank you. <laughs> we just say because we were taught to say it. It was drilled into us to say thank you. You didn't say thank you, we'll say pardon me. Say excuse me. Pardon me, excuse me. Those are two more all day long. Pardon me, excuse me. Ooh, excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. Thought you were talking to me. Pardon me. <laughs> I've excused myself to walls. <laughs> excuse me. Oh, it's a wall. <laughs> Pardon me. <laughs> I've had people step on my foot, crush all my toes, and I'll say, uh, excuse me. <laughs> huh? Oh, excuse me. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and then I'll go home, and I'll be all by myself, and I'll burp, burp excuse me. <laughs> then when I realize I'm alone, I go, uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry? What am I sorry for? Just a guilt response, you know, because I feel guilty about things like that. Actually, I feel guilty about a lot of things that I have really no reason to feel guilty about. Passing a hitchhiker is a perfect example. I'll feel so guilty about that, especially if the guy glares at me when I go by, you know. Gives her one of these shots. 
Now, I feel so guilty about passing him that I'll make excuses in sign language. I'm turning at the next corner. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> then I'll look in the mirror and I'll see him give me his reply. <laughs> Thank you, too. It's just that early training is just so powerful, and yet, yet the government has no faith in it. It's really weird, because every one of us here, one thing we were taught was how to cross the street. I mean, it was just pounded into our heads. Don't you cross when there's traffic. Look both ways. When it's clear, then you go. Drilled into our minds. Now, how much faith does the government have in that training? I'll go up to any busy intersection. There'll be traffic just roaring by. And I look across the street, and there's that little sign. Don't walk. Well, I know I'm not supposed to walk. I mean, I was taught that. I'd be a suicidal idiot to step off the curb. Then when all the cars stop, I look up, and the sign says, walk. Well, I know it's time to walk. Obviously, I can see there's nothing going on by now. I mean, they don't give us any credit for having any sense. And they must also think we're gazelles. <laughs> I'll step off the curb and I'll walk about six steps, look up, and the sign has changed back to don't walk. I mean, that's ridiculous. If they're going to put a sign up, be practical. Put up one that said, this is a short light, so run your buns off. <laughs> I'm afraid to say thank you. I am too. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Too. Yeah, it was very nice. Don't thank, thank me. Thank you. <laughs> it's true. It's Get conditioning. I used to have uh, when we go on trips. There are certain people who read signs. You're not for for some reason they're driving down the highway and they just read anything. Oh, I do. All Holiday and fourteen. Anything that's there, they read them out loud. Oh, I do that. Like I did nobody that. else sees them or hears them. I used to uh, drive on the road by myself all the time. I used to read. Them. I still follow them. Yeah. Like the walk, don't walk thing, which is really silly. I've been on corners, there'd be nobody around, no traffic, and it says don't walk, so I don't. I stand yeah. here. Another thing, the, the one bugs me is the, uh, the button on the light standards. Well, you want to cross, you're supposed to... Press button for green light. Now, for years, I pressed that button. I never thought anything about it. And then one day, I pressed it, and I didn't press it, and I timed it both ways, and it doesn't make the light change any faster. <laughs> This, I don't know what it's there for. And I think it just to relieve it, your frustration. Yeah, it doesn't come on anyway. You know what bothers me? To... You're, you're, you're standing waiting for an elevator, and there are two or three people there, and you press the button... And the guy standing right next to you will always walk over and press it again, which intimates yeah. that you are stupid, you didn't press it, your press wasn't good enough, I press it better, I've, it happens every time. And then another person comes up and they see two, and he goes up and he presses the button again. I do that too. I, I call that ego assertion. You That's know, right. Say, <laughs> My turn to press the button. Yeah. The worst is when you're on the elevator and the doors are starting to close and somebody's rushing toward the elevator and you can never find that open door button. It's always like... Uh, <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. I always want to go back down and say, I'm sorry. sorry. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> that would probably close too quick before they could get on again. You know? Okay, let me take a break. We're yes. coming right back. Stay where you are. <laughs> My next guest tonight is... Uh... <clears throat> is Mr. Tom Braden, who's a very successful syndicated columnist. So he has written a book. It's, it's a fascinating book because it's, a, it's, a, it's about... Oh, you got to run. That's right, Bobby. I told you I was going to... Because you got to go to work tonight. Yes. Downtown L.A.? Yes. Fifth Thank you, Bobby. Los Angeles, folks. Thank you. Goodbye. Good work. Good work. As I was saying, Tom Braden has written a fascinating book. It's a... Uh, it's the problems that exist between generations, and those of you who have children know the problems that exist. Um, he is, uh, as I said, a syndicated columnist. He's also been a newspaper reporter, a teacher, an intelligence officer, a parachute jumper. Uh, and he's written this book about his family. And uh, fascinating. Would you welcome, please, Mr. Tom Braden. Good to see you again. Well, I remember a book once called Cheaper by the Dozen that they made into a movie, which was somebody who had about uh, a dozen children. But eight is enough, right? Eight is enough. Yeah. When did you realize eight <laughs> is enough? Well, because I had eight problems, and then I realized that I was the ninth. Uh, I think if you have eight children, you have nine problems. Yeah, that's right. Let's say yourself, because uh, you have a lot to worry about with eight children. When, uh, what are the age? What's the age uh, span in the, in the kids? Well, they run from uh, twenty-three to ten. Twenty-three to ten. Yeah. Uh huh. 
You, you say in the book that you spend almost as time, much time playing the father role as most people do with their jobs, which is usually not the case. Well, I think it is the case. Really? Don't you spend a lot of time in being a father? Yeah, even though my kids are, are, are growing up and out of the house. It's the old saying, is it? Little, prob little children, little problems, big children, big problems. Yeah, that's correct. You know, it gets to be uh, 3 o'clock in the morning and you keep, it's, you know, you're trying to sleep uh, and you have a job to do the next morning, but you keep saying to yourself, I wonder where she is. Oh, see, I didn't have the problem. I have all boys. Oh, well, I have five uh, girls, and that's the difference. Uh, Fathers worry an awful lot about girls. You know why they do? Because they remember when they were young. <laughs> uh-huh. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, you go up to the bedroom to kiss your daughter goodnight, and, and, and maybe there's uh, somebody there. <laughs> See, now, when we grew up, I don't think I would ever... That would never cross my mind to say I'm going to have a girl in my room in the house. Well, this is a new thing. Yeah. That uh, must be I, difficult to cope with. It's tough for a father. I, it may be all right for them. Yeah. <laughs> if, now, when, you, when your daughter's got to be a dating age, did you want to know and see, meet the young man before he went out and uh, have a little chat before you came downstairs, your daughter came downstairs and all of that? Yeah, all I did all that. I did all that. Things? I want to tell you what happened to me. I, yeah. I, I did all of that, and then one day he brought a girl home from college for the weekend. And, it's your son now? Uh, yes, that's right. And Joan and I went up and fixed up a room up in the attic uh, because we didn't have any extra rooms and I wanted to make sure that she had a room. So we made the bed and we fixed it up. We put flowers. And then when the girl left two days later, uh, I said goodbye to her and I said, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. And I, 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 I said, I hope you had a nice time up in the ro uh, room. And she said, Thank you, Mr. Braden, but it was... The bed was a little small for two. And? Well, I... I there is no and. I looked at Joan, and I... I and she looked at me, and I, I, we closed the door, and, and I said to, to Joan, well, you know, at least we made it possible. Um, <laughs> propriety was... Uh, propriety was reserved. You see, now, that, that, what do you say? When you have children that age, do you say, hey, it's my house and you are not to stay in that room with a girl? Or under the more liberal mores, I guess, that we live in? It bothers a lot of, a lot of parents. Well, it's, yeah, it's a tough generational gap because you have a new morality. Um, you know, the pill uh, has made a great a lot of difference. And, and actually, this is true. It has. Uh, I, I think that morals tend to follow reason. And reason tells girls that they don't have to have marriage in order to have love and devotion. And we always thought that marriage was synonymous with love and devotion, and they're not so sure it's true. And I think all a father can do is say, well, you know, I, I, I don't approve of it. It isn't the way I grew up, but uh, there's some point to it. Yeah, it, it's tough. You see, I remember when I, when I grew up, I, I think the kids nowadays have grown up with a kind of an attitude of thinking that uh, maybe it's because they, were, they grew up during a very unpopular war, um, they went through all of the things in government, you know, and they well, seem to think that everybody... It's the game, the way to play it. Yeah, and, and I think, really, that the generation that grew up, that, that sort of my older children's generation, the oldest ones, probably had a tougher time than you and I did. You mentioned the war. Right. They had an unpopular war, which we didn't have. They had uh, marijuana, and, and we never knew about that, and we weren't able to advise them, because I wouldn't have known in high school even how to spell marijuana. Don't you remember going to see a movie called Reefer Madness no. that played around years? Yeah. It's now kind of a camp movie. Yeah, but I was in Dubuque, and maybe they didn't show it. No, there. not in Dubuque. They wouldn't show that, no. Yeah, that was true, and it was considered, you know, that was the degradation to end all degradation. Now, have your, have your kids... Oh, well, I know in the book, uh, you've asked you, you've discussed uh, drugs with your kids. Now, what, what do you say to them when your kids come home and say, yeah, we, we've tried some pot? Did they ever say, hey, to, hey, Dad, would you, would you no, like, I, like I to try rule a little? Is, my rule is a tough thing for a father because, uh, uh, you know, a father is supposed to uh, encourage obedience to the law, right? And then uh, at 12 o'clock and you get the phone call, uh, and I always try to take the phone calls because I sort of think that's the father's job. Take, take those late-night phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> They're never good. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and the voice says, Dad, <clears throat> I'm in jail. Did that, ha that happen? Yeah, that happened. And it turned out that there was a defective taillight. And after the car was stopped for a defective taillight, why, well, then begins the big search. And they found some uh, marijuana, and uh, there he is in jail. So 
So the father is, uh, is faced with this uh, choice between loyalties. Uh, you're loyal to the law or you're loyal to your son, and that naturally your answer is, uh, hold on, you know, you're not the first guy that was ever in jail, and I'll get on it in the morning. And then you go to his bank account and withdraw whatever he's got. <laughs> and see what you can do about it. Right. I, I, I've been through the same situation. But now I think they are... Uh... Uh, minimizing some of those laws, so at least it's not a criminal offense anymore, and you don't you don't get booked for it. The first lady came under a little flack because she she spoke her mind about what she felt on certain issues in the day, and I thought she showed a lot of courage to do it. And she said the other day, I don't think the fact that you're a president's wife or your husband is in the limelight should prohibit you from speaking out on something that you honestly believe in. I think it took a lot of yeah courage I, I, for her to express those views. I agree with that. I think I was surprised that people acted as though they were surprised, but I don't think they were really surprised. It shows that double standard we have, you know. we Same thing we were talking about. Uh, we have the law, and then we have the habit, and we know that kids are smoking marijuana, so it seems to me, you know, she faced it. Right. You had a, something in your book about uh, when your, one of your boys, I think, was in college, and then all of a sudden decided that that wasn't for him. That always crushes parents in a way when they they think, well, I've done this, now I've, I've furnished money for an education, and all of a sudden you find that your child gets in school and doesn't particularly enjoy it and wants to do something else. Yeah, well, that's it. you're never sure whether that's it or whether that's the stage, uh, which I call in the book the animal stage, where, where the, that's your bag, Dad. You know, every kid, every boy particularly goes through the stage of, well, that's your bag, Dad. Suits and ties and uh, coats and vests, that's your bag, and college. So in anything that is really their own identity, or they think is their own identity, they're going to do just the opposite. They have to rebel against us. Yeah, to a certain extent. Yeah. What did you do when one of them said, uh, hey, I want to change my lifestyle? Oh, I had a hippie for a while. Uh, he's no longer a hippie. I had a rule in our family. What we did with the, the animal stage was uh, awful tough. Uh, I hated to do it, but I just cut off the money supply. 